Morning, everyone. So, we're going into the second week of February, which means it's six weeks since our New Year's resolutions. I went to the gym the other day, and uh, the folks there told me that they've experienced like a 30 to 40 de percent decrease already, um, you know, in from the first two weeks in, in January. And so, uh, you know, I was very curious about New Year's resolutions and why people make New Year's resolutions. And I decided to just kind of look up to see what, what are some of the surveys, what are, what, what are some of the studies that have been going on in regards to New Year's resolutions. And the University of Scranton um, did a study and uh, they published this in the clinical of the Journal of Clinical Psychology. That's what, Journal of Clinical Psychology. So let's take a look and see what they found in regards to um, New Year's resolutions. Because, you know, we all, we all have an idea of, you know, how well we maintain our New Year's resolutions. So let's take a look at this study here. First of all, this says 45% of America, uh, 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 the number of Americans that usually make New Year's resolutions, they're 45% of, of, of Americans. So, you know, that is probably maybe one or two rows to this way if we're looking at our congregation, okay? 17% infrequently make New Year's resolutions. So I would probably say that's maybe, maybe this side right here, that aisle down there and this side. All right? And so that leaves the rest of you. That leaves 38%. They absolutely never. So you guys right here, absolutely never make New Year's resolutions. Here's something also very interesting. Only 8%, only 8% of those that make New Year's resolution achieve it successfully. That's maybe like the first three rows, maybe the first two rows, okay? Non cloud, including the people on the stage. All right. 49% infrequently achieve. That's the bulk of people. 24% never succeed and fail. I admire those people who, uh, who answered that question. All right. Here's something else that's very interesting New Year's resolution success rate by age. All right. All right, this might surprise you. 39% of people in their 20s achieve success with their resolutions. That surprised me. Did that, did that surprise you? No? No, how many of you are in your 20s here? Your 20s, just a couple, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, put your hand down. Heaven forbid. All right. All right, so 39%. But this is what I found most interesting. 14% of people over the age of 50 achieve success with their resolution. So the younger generation is doing a better job with their resolutions. How many of you guys are over 50? Nobody is raising their hand. <laughs> All right. So I decided to look up what resolution meant. And... It, interestingly enough, on um, Daniel Webster uh, Dictionary Online, the word resolution was trending in the top 1% of searches. So it's interesting that during this time, a lot of people are kind of like looking up what resolution means, so before they make their resolution, they will understand exactly what they're making. So resolution means the act of determining. Resolution also means a commitment to do something different. Commitment to do something different. But let me be really honest with you. Resolutions require change, and change is a hard thing to do. Because we are ingrained, ingrained in our habits, in our patterns of living. And, 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 and you see, change is hard, and, and actually there's scientific proof to substantiate the fact that change is hard. And I'm not going to go through all the what happens with our neurons, but in short, what happens is that our, our brain develops patterns, like, you know, a, a, a 
car, the groove on the car on, on, on a, a muddy road, okay? Grooves, all right? And so the more that we, we engage in that behavior, the deeper the grooves get. And once the grooves get to a certain depth, it is almost impossible to get out and create a new pattern. As often, we start out really great making our resolutions. We are determined, we are committed. But then just about the middle of February, it starts weakening. Or it doesn't even have to be New Year's resolutions. It could be any time of the year. Maybe it's a birthday or maybe something traumatic happened to you that really convicted you to make some changes in your life. But about six to eight weeks out, it begins to weaken. And then we end up where we started from in the first place. And the pattern repeats itself. And what I found very interesting, I will be very honest about my particular life, is that when I make resolutions and I am, you know, that percentage that never succeeds in our resolutions, the person or the thing that I blame for my failure is not me, but the resolution. Have you noticed that? Oh, it was too hard in the first place. It was too unattainable in the first place. You know, I, I'll never make, this is why I don't make resolutions. And so we blame the resolution, but we do not look at ourselves and take accountability of where we stand in regards to those resolutions. And so the patterns of behavior and habits hold us captive. And it truly is difficult to break that cycle we experience that cycle in our everyday lives. We also experience that cycle in our spiritual lives. And when we evaluate the patterns of our spiritual life, the patterns of our health or our finances or whatever other aspects of our life, you almost see an identical pattern and reaction. These next two weeks... We're going to be taking a look at two books in the Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're going to take a look at how people in the Bible reacted in the changes in their lives, and especially in their spiritual life and their spiritual journey. And we're going to see how similar we are to them. Their story is our story, and our story is their story. And the book of Ezra is really not, not a book that a lot of people, you know, spend a lot of time in. And as a matter of fact, um, just for curiosity, I just looked up which were the least popular books of the Bible. And did you know that Obadiah was the least popular book of the Bible? Did you know that? And Ezra is around like 14, 15, somewhere around there. And so we don't really take a look at the book of Ezra a lot. But as I started reading about it, and I'm thinking, this is a crazy story, but it's the story of our lives. And almost every page and every sentence, I saw myself. And so we're going to take a journey these next two weeks. We're going to look at Ezra today and Nehemiah tomorrow. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we unpack the stories of old today, Reveal to us our stories for today. And God, may we learn from you. May we hear your voice. And God, I boldly pray that, that we may be transformed once and for all to the people that you called us to be. Thanks, God. In your son's name, amen. So let, let me give you a little bit of background in the, in, in, in the story or, or in the book of Ezra and exactly what happened. You know, first of all, the book of Ezra was, was most likely written by a prophet by name of Ezra. And I find it very interesting of the 10 chapters in this book, only four chapters actually is the story of Ezra. The other six chapters, well, it's the story of, of God's people. And so during this particular time, God's people were in captivity in Babylon. Now, some of you may be aware of the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar, who was a Babylonian king, came and he, um, he overtook uh, Jerusalem 
and he took back to Babylon um, lots of captives, lots of uh, uh, the, the, the Hebrew captives, of which one was Daniel. That's where we get the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so when King Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem, what he also did was he took all the gold and all the silver and all the artifacts of the temple and absolutely decimated the temple. So there was nothing there left but rubble. Now, we have to ask the question, well, why was there a captivity? Well, first of all, God's people turned away from him. And in spite of repeated, repeated, repeated warnings from God, um, and, and in spite of his pleadings, utilizing prophets to kind of just help the people understand that they are really going down a slippery slope and to turn back to God, despite all of that, God's people did not listen. And so they were taken away to captivity to Babylon. And so this is where we find the opening of the book of Ezra. In that the Babylonian kingdom, by this time, was, was overtaken by the Persian, or the Medes and Persian Empire. And King Cyrus, who was Persian king, came into power. And this is exactly what we see in the first chapter of Ezra. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. Here's what's very interesting. Cyrus was a pagan king. Cyrus was a pagan king. But God did something to his heart. And what's so amazing is, is that he listened. He was aware of what God was doing in his heart. And so God was stirring in his heart and said to him, Listen, I need you to make a proclamation. And this is the proclamation. And this is Cyrus's voice here. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. I love this verse. Do you know why? Because it reminds us that God can appoint whoever he wants to appoint. And you don't have to be skilled. You don't have to be a good talker. You don't have to be a good scholar. You don't even have to be a believer. God can choose and appoint whoever he wants. And so I don't ever want to hear anybody say, God can't choose me. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. And so what he does is that he lets these people go. He lets the captives go back. And so the first captives go back to Jerusalem, led by a man by the name of Zerubbabel, and he took with him about 50,000 people. And so they make this journey back. And it's a long journey back. And here's another amazing thing. Cyrus provides everything for their journey. And not only that, Cyrus takes 5,400 uh, 5, articles of gold and silver that were part of the original temple. And he says to Zerubbabel and the people, here, take it back. That's worth millions of dollars. Here, take it back with you. And here's what's interesting. Cyrus himself went to where it was stored, brought out the articles, and gave it to Zerubbabel. This tells me that God wanted his people back really bad. And it was time to return into the promised land. And so this moment, this captivity, this 70 years of captivity was really kind of like a, a reset button for God's people, a, a time out per se, so that maybe the people can, can kind of get their ducks in a row. So it was time to go back. In this story, we find mercy and grace intersecting and journaling, journeying in a parallel way. What is the difference between mercy and grace? Well, here it is. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. 
And the children of Israel actually deserve to be in captivity for the rest of their lives. But God in his mercy says, you know, it's time. It's time to go back. And so mercy is God not giving us as we deserve. And I love what Max Licato says, mercy pardons us. You know, I, um, I ran a red light years ago, Jose, <laughs> not recently, years ago. So I ran a red light, red light, and I get caught by the policeman. And this is what mercy is. Policeman comes up and says, ma'am, do you know you ran a red, red light? Yes, officer, I did run a red light. And the policeman says, I'm not going to give you a ticket. That's mercy because I deserved a ticket. Here's what grace is. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. And the children of Israel did not deserve the, the riches that were given back to them as they took this journey. Let me give you an example of what grace is. I run a red light. I get pulled over. The officer comes, ma'am, do you run a red light? I say, yes, yes, I knew, officer, I ran a red light. Officer says, I'm not going to give you a ticket. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to give you a ticket, but I'm going to give you $100. That's my kind of policeman. Is Chris Cromwell here? Chris is our a policeman with um, Howard County. That's grace. You see, that's grace. And again, I love what Max Licato calls grace. Grace is God walking into your world with a sparkle in his eye and an offer that's hard to resist. How can I not resist $100 given to me when I absolutely did not deserve it? How could people not experience and not accept the freedom that God gives us? Freedom from captivity. But so many times, you know, when freedom is right in front of us, in whatever stronghold is keeping us, whether it's an addiction, whether it's, you know, uh, 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 unforgiveness, whether it's, 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 it's regret, whether it's fear, whether, you know, whether it's money, whether it's debt, whether it's food, whatever it is, whatever it is, sometimes when we find ourselves in the stronghold, when we find ourselves captive, by these things. We try to get out of it ourselves. But you see, God's power to set us free from captivity is not limited by our resources. And so when God set his people free, it was way beyond their resources. It was even way beyond what they could conceive. So they returned to Jerusalem and they start rebuilding. But they first begin to rebuild an altar. And an altar here is very, it's very significant that they chose to rebuild an altar first because number one, it was symbolic of God's presence and God's protection. You see, when they went back, it was about 48 years since they left. And the people who were living in that land started coming into the land that were theirs. And so the uh, children of Israel had to come back and basically reclaim their land again. And so there was a lot of people there, and so it was not a very safe place for them. So they decided to build an altar. They decided to build an altar as a center for worship, a place in which they can daily seek God's forgiveness from their sins. They decided to, to rebuild an altar as a symbol of rededicating themselves to God, recommitting themselves to God, establishing for themselves what is important, their priority. In another word, they were making a New Year's resolution in the rebuilding of this altar. And they made a commitment not to repeat the mistake again. They made a commitment, we will not go back. And so they finished rebuilding the altar. There was a lot of celebration to that. And then they started to do what they were charged to do in the first place, and that was to rebuild the temple. And so they began to rebuild the foundation of the temple based on the foundation from Solomon's temple. That was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar came. 
and it was a spiritual high for the community when the foundation was done. And when you take a look at what is described here in, um, I think it's Ezra 3.11, you're going to see a scene pretty much like the worship here at New Hope. There was dancing, there was singing, there was clapping, there was cymbals, there was drums, there was trumpets. It was a huge celebration. And that gave the people so much encouragement to keep on going, to build the rest of the temple. And as the building project progressed, they began to face the opposition. There were some people that tried to infiltrate into their workforce to sabotage and stop the rebuilding, many times using political pressure. And here's what's interesting that happened to the people. They stopped. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them to frustrate their plans. Discouragement and fear was what they faced, and discouragement and fear are the two greatest obstacles that we face in our spiritual journey. They're powerful. They're powerful enough to stop God's kingdom work. Powerful enough to stop God's plan for your life. Powerful enough to stop your relationship with God. Powerful enough to stop dreams and wishes and hopes. Discouragement and fear is like a, a, a silent malignancy. Because you see, discouragement chips away at motivation. It chips away at inspiration. It chips away at, at enthusiasm. And fear immobilizes us. We come to a standstill. We are stunted. We die. And I find how easy it is for us, how easy it was for them to succumb, how easy it is for us to succumb to discouragement and fear. All last month, we studied about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And you know, it's really easy to be a follower of Jesus um, when things are going great. It's easy to be a follower of Jesus when Jesus meets our expectations, right? It's easy to be a follower of Jesus when God's blessings are pouring out upon us. It's easier to praise and worship God when we're not carrying burdens and heaviness. But what happens, what happens when things begin to get a little hot under your feet? When things begin to burn a little bit? When things are not going as planned? When you experience failure, what happens? What happens to us as people? You know, I used to have a trainer in the gym, and she was just so focused on the burn. You know, everything was about the burn, the burn. And she would always take me to the point of the burn. And I, I mean, I would, I would cry. I mean, literally cry because it was just burning, and I don't like hot. And this is what she always told me. She said, if you stop because of the burn, you will never experience the next level of, and we can fill in the blanks. When you stop as it gets painful, we will never experience the next level of. And you know, it's really interesting. These people went back and they were doing what God called them to do. And yet, they experienced opposition. I don't know about you, but many times when I know that God has led me into something, and all of a sudden, it's like everything is falling apart. Things are not working right. And what happens to me is that I begin to second guess I began to doubt myself. Did I really hear God right? Wait a minute, something must be wrong because things are not going well, you know? And opposition, I realized, does not always mean something is not God, part of God's plan. We have to remember that. That sometimes it is part of God's plan. But oftentimes we slip 
into a state of, okay, well, we'll wait. Okay, there's opposition, so we will wait. We will wait to see what God's going to do. We will wait to see uh, until God opens the door. And then we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. And in the book of Haggai, it tells us exactly what happened to the people as they waited. The people said, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. We can talk ourselves out of God's plan for our lives. Opposition does not necessarily mean something is not part of God's plan. And because of this discouragement, they lost motivation, they lost inspiration. Because of this fear, they were immobilized, and the work stopped for 15 years. Now, a lot of us probably are not aware that during this time, during this stoppage, God rose up, raised up two prophets to come and try to motivate and encourage the people. That was Haggai and Zechariah. So when you go back and read the books of Haggai and Zechariah, you will see the messages that they were given to this people during this time in which everything came to a standstill because of fear and discouragement. And so Haggai comes and says to them in a very blunt way, he says, the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai saying, why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruin? You see, what happened during these 15 years, priority shifted. Work on the temple stopped, and people then began putting their own personal lives together. And so Haggai comes and he sees these palatial homes and says, wait a minute. Wait a minute, why are you focusing all your time and energy and money on these luxurious homes when the house of God is yet in ruins? And here's the interesting thing, because if the temple is to be the focal point of that community as a symbol of their relationship with God, the temple unfinished then henceforth becomes a symbol of their current relationship with God. And so here's what Haggai says. Haggai says, look what's happening to you. That's pretty strong rebuke. Look what's happening to you. You have planted much but harvest little. You eat but are not satisfied. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. What is he saying here? What he's saying is that, folks, you are doing everything but gaining nothing because it's all about your self. The harder they worked, the less they had for themselves. Why? Because they ignored their spiritual lives. They ignored building and rebuilding their spiritual lives. If we put God first, he will provide for our deepest needs. If we put God in any other place, our needs become deeper and deeper and deeper, and there is nothing that can fill it. All our efforts are futile, and there will, be, there will never be an end to that constant pattern of doing and doing and doing with very little results. So something happened as a result of Haggai and Zechariah coming the people began to obey the message from the Lord their God. The people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. And the message is, I am with you, says the Lord. And so the Lord, get this, the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. And they began to work on the house of the Lord. And this is what people needed to hear. They needed, they did not need to hear, all right, come on, guys, go to it. You can do it. We believe in you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All they needed to hear was God saying, I am with you. And the presence of God is the spark, is the only spark we need to help us in our discouragement. It is the antidote 
for discouragement. When God says, I am with you, and God does not say, I'm going to tell you how to get out of what you're in. No, God merely says, I am with you. I am with you. And with that, our enthusiasm is sparked. I am with you also means that in the depths of your discouragement, God is with you. He's feeling it. He's feeling your despair. He's not saying, Caesar, I know you're discouraged, but I'm with you. Go in strength. No, he says, Caesar, I know you're discouraged. Come on. I feel it. I'm with you. We are going to do this together. Zechariah comes and says, This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him, and he will complete it. The antidote for fear is the Spirit of God, folks. It's the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is just not a bunch of words. The Spirit of God, look at this, look at this, is, is, is greater than any force. It's greater than any strength. And the Spirit of God moves mighty mountains that we feel cannot be moved. The Spirit of God levels the plain before us. That's the antidote to fear. And then people experienced a huge recommitment to finish the temple. But that's not the, the, the rest of it. The story gets even more complex. I'm going to go through this quickly here. What happens is now Ezra, 58 years later, after they first came to Judah, Ezra then leads a second group of exiles to Jerusalem. And what he finds absolutely shatters them. The temple is built. It's great. It's nice. But the people's lives, their, their temples of their hearts were a mess. The spark of enthusiasm was absolutely gone. Their commitment was gone. And what does Ezra find when he walks into this group of people? He finds apathy. He finds laziness in their relationship with God. He, he finds a lack of concern, an, an indifference to God. He finds that in the course of routine living, in the activities of daily living, the prevailing culture begins seeping in into the lives of the people. Men had married pagan wives. And priests had also married pagan wives. And so what Ezra found was that there was no difference. What distinguished God's people to any other people on the earth. And you know, I find that it is no different in my life today. And I'm going to just be very honest in saying there's no different in my life today sometimes because it is so easy for me to compromise my commitment to God. It is so easy for me to compromise my time with God. It is so easy to compromise my priorities with God. It is so easy for me to slip back into the routine of my life, into the routine of business. Because, you know, compromise is a slippery slope here. And before we realize it, we become lazy. We become lazy, and it's very easy to go back to where we never want to go. I don't know how many times in my life I have said, I will never go back there again. I will never be that heavy again. I will never eat that much chocolate again. I will never be that busy again. I will never ignore my husband again. I will never get a ticket again. But it's so easy, folks to slip back into that. You know, before Christmas, I was going to the gym five to six times a week. After New Year's, I was going to the gym three to four times a week. 
Two weeks after New Year's, I was going to gym two to three times a week. And then for the last two and a half weeks, I wasn't going to gym at all. <laughs> Until this week. It's so easy for us to slip into that pattern and go back to where we never wanted to go back. And so the people realized what happened to them. And Ezra stood in front of the people and listened to these words, folks. Because when I read those words, I, that's my cry when I find myself so distant from God, slipping into the routines again. Oh my God, I am utterly ashamed. How many of you have really been utterly ashamed before God? I blush to lift my face to you. I'm so ashamed sometimes. I, I, can't even, I can't even look at God. For our sins are piled higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. And now, O oh God, what can we say after all this? For once again, we have abandoned your commands. I've said that so many times in my life. I don't ever want to do that again. But we once again, once again have commanded your, uh, abandoned your commands. We are being punished because of our wickedness and our great guilt. But we have actually been punished far less than we deserve. Folks, that's the language of mercy here. That's the language of mercy that when we come before God, we can say, God, we've done it again. But you are greatly to be praised because we have been punished far less than we deserved. And get this, the next verse in Ezra. We have been unfaithful to God, but in spite of this, there is hope for Israel. And that's grace. You see, in the cycle of our lives, in the up and downs in our spiritual lives, there is always hope. There is always grace. In the discouragement and in the fear, there's always hope. And there's always grace. That's how much God adores us. And that he does not want us to be bogged down by the cycle of unsuccessful resolutions. Yes, he does want us to create a new path and new patterns of living. But in our failures, there is mercy and there is grace. I'm going to end with this quote by John Piper. Grace is not simply leniency when we have sin. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Yes, amen. And you see, this is the hope that I have. To be able to make a commitment before God and stick with it. Because God gives me that gift, that grace to be able to stick it. Grace is power. It's not just pardon. Therefore, the effort we make to obey God is not an effort done in our own strength. Amen. Remember, it's not by our might and not by our power, but by the Spirit of God, but in the strength which God supplies. I don't know about you, but I want to increase my odds of committing to my resolutions. And the story here in the people of God in the book of Ezra gives me the hope that I can do it, not because of me, but because of the mercy of God and because of the grace of his power. I invite you to take your Connect card And in the back, here are some next steps. I don't know where you are in your resolution journey or not, or if you even have a resolution, but I just want to spend some time just thinking about these next steps.
from the story that we heard today from God's people. Do you want to accept God's love, his grace and mercy? Because it's pervasive. It's pervasive in the ups and downs of our spiritual journey. Or if you, you feel that you want to commit to a new worship of God because of his mercy and his grace, check that. Or perhaps to overcome opposition with God's word. Because, you know, it was God's word that helped the people overcome their opposition. Even just the verse that says, not by might or my power, but by the Spirit of God can we be free and overcome. Amen.